let me let me kick off. So I'm the, the head of the Open Research Programme um, at UKRN. Um, so I wanted to kick off, uh, but I'm sorry, just to, to add, I'm joined today and delighted to be joined today by Tim Newton from King's College and Anna uh, from uh, the University of Surrey, who are going to um, be talking about particular aspects of the the open research program that uh, they're involved in. Um, so you won't have to listen to me for the entire time. Um, but I wanted to say a few words of introduction um, just to, to get us off. Uh, and I've, I've started putting this slide up whenever I start a presentation of this kind, just to remind myself, actually, but also remind others about what the UK Reproducibility Network, UKRN, is and what it's for. And really, it's a platform for collaboration. It's to enable the researchers, institutions and others, such as publishers and funders, to collaborate with each other to promote research improvement, better research, reproducibility, rigour, those sorts of good things. Um, and so that, that collaborative aspect <clears throat> is absolutely central to pretty much everything that UKRN does. And it's pretty central to the, the Open Research Programme as well, which is a collaboration of now 22 universities uh, across the United Kingdom who have all come together to, to promote the acceleration and uptake of high quality open research practices. Um, but actually, I'm going to say a few words before we get to open research, and I hope Anna and Tim will excuse me, but there's some things that UKRN is doing which I'm just too excited about not to mention, so I hope you'll bear with me about this. Uh, we will get to the Open Research Programme reasonably soon, um, but I just want to take a quick detour before we get there. As I say, there's some really exciting things going on, and this is an opportunity for me just to quickly mention them. I think you'll be interested. And I'm going to start by talking about research culture, which is obviously a, quite a topical thing to talk about at the moment, given discussions around the next ref. Um, and I wanted to just say, why, why would UKRN be interested in, in research culture? And why should actually we all be interested in research culture? And for UKRN in particular, I think this slide helps us think about it. Is this the sort of culture that we, that we need to support good research practice? And these are figures from a, a survey that's quoted in the UK Committee for, uh, for, for Research Integrity's annual statement this year of, of the, the numbers of or the proportions of, of researchers undertaking questionable research practices. And you can see some figures there overall and sort of globally and, and for the UK. Um, and, you know, these to me are quite sobering figures. So over half of the respondents included authors in, in papers who had not contributed sufficiently. So they felt encouraged, pressured perhaps uh, to, to do that. Uh, not conducting a thorough review of and manuscripts, over 40% inadequately supervising a junior co-worker. So we're providing an environment, I think, which is making it quite hard to do the right thing. And so that kind of re research culture is one that we really need to address. And it's, it's one of the reasons why UKRN is interested in research culture, because unless we have the right kind of research culture, we're simply not going to enable researchers um, to, to do the highest quality research that they, they want to do. So what is, uh, and of course that, that is why the REF is, is taking a, a keen interest in people, culture and environment. And of course there has been a lot of discussion around the REF proposals um, and there's been some, uh, some commentary to the effect that this is moving too quickly, too soon in that sort of direction. But I'd just like to quote this uh, from, from Gemma Derrick, who's a University of Bristol researcher, actually, in a recent commentary she's made, that in a sense, the opposition really shows why the change is needed. So the, the focus on research outputs has had many benefits, but to some extent has led us also to some of the problems that we're now facing. Um, and so these are some of the things that that research uh, that UKRN is doing around this, and, and this is sort of where I wanted us wanted to lead to in some ways. We've done quite a lot of work on research culture, 
Um, we've been working with, with UKRI on sort of mapping the landscape. We've produced a catalogue of, of culture projects. We're just starting, and this is one of the things I really wanted to, to mention, we're just starting a new project um, just a couple of weeks ago, which is funded by UK and institutions coming together and pooling some of their, their Research England Enhancing Research Culture Funds, those of them that are lucky enough to have those funds, on how do institutions uh, use research evidence when they're developing strategies and making decisions that affect research culture. So are we as universities evidence informed in that kind of a way? So I think that's a really interesting question to ask ourselves at the moment when there's a lot of interventions going on to enhance research culture and you know what to what extent are we as as evidence producing organizations using the kind of evidence that we that we um that we value so highly we're we're also working with the uk committee on research integrity on some work on research integrity enablers and inhibitors so what enables high levels of research integrity and what inhibits high levels of research integrity that's a literature review mainly, uh, and we were just talking with UK Corrie only this morning, and the, the findings of that literature review are very much in line with the sorts of figures that, that I quoted earlier, the kinds of issues that are arising um, and the kinds of sort of publication pressures and other kinds of pressures that researchers are under, which in perhaps inhibit high levels of research integrity. So that's why UKRN is interested in, in research culture, the environment in which the research is undertaken, and some of the things that we're doing about them. And of course, this matters not just in STEM, not just in arts and humanities, across all of research. Um, you have seen this, perhaps, this, uh, this blog post from Anton Howes a few, a few weeks ago. Does history have a replication crisis? Uh, a question that is controversial within history because it's not clear entirely what replication would mean in history but it, it, it raises a really interesting question and one that we've we've talked with Anton about and they're keen to explore the ways in which UKRN can work uh, across the disciplines to to really make a difference here this is a, a meeting we had only yesterday we were working with a practice research advisory group in the British Psychological Society to explore issues like reproducibility, transparency, positionality, what do these terms and concepts mean across these sorts of discipline areas and what can we learn from each other in terms of trying to enhance rigour and support interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, undisciplinary kinds of research into the future. So I think those sorts of conversations are immensely important and we, we as UKRN I think are quite keen to carry on promoting those in different sorts of areas. And another piece of work that we're just starting, uh, I don't think we've announced yet, but um, um, hopefully not preempting this too much, is uh, we are starting work um, with a, a story associate, someone funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, to look at the ways in which research reports, so art, journal articles, for, for example, uh, tell particular stories about research. And can we draw from narrative theory, from story scholarship, uh, in the humanities to see whether or not we can tell better stories about research that are, are more truthful to the process, the, the often messy process of research, uh, and that tell a more truthful and honest story about that without losing sort of the, the compelling uh, nature of, of stories about research. So lots of exciting things going on there. And of course, um, the, the transparency there is uh, reflected in in some of the work we've done previously with the university of surrey on on uh, what open and transparent research like research looks like in different disciplines but none of that is what you came here to hear about i was too excited about some of those things not to mention them but you're here to talk about or to hear about the work we're doing in open research in particular um, so the open research program we will come to in a minute that's the the piece that's highlighted there the graphic that you can see there on the slide is the um, is the UNESCO definition, very broad definition of open research. And really, I think we'd have to say we're mainly focusing in the open research program on, on some of what they're called op open scientific knowledge or open research knowledge. There is lots of work going on in other places and to a certain extent in the open research program around infrastructures and engagement with societal actors and dialogue with, with other knowledge systems. But I think we're probably mainly focusing in the green section. But that UNESCO definition is incredibly important to us, not least because 
our government is one of them, the 194 that have signed up to this across the world, but also because we've been working with UNESCO and the Swiss Reproducibility Network to produce a guide for institutions that are implementing or trying to implement this, this broad recommendation from UNESCO. And that guide will be released, I hope, as part of the toolkit uh, that UNESCO are uh, promoting, and that will be released this week at the UNESCO General Assembly. So we're really excited about that as well. And we're just kicking off a, uh, another thing, just to quickly mention, uh, the last thing I'll mention before we get on to the Open Research Programme, uh, we're just kicking off a, another piece of work to look at the ways in which universities have, have been implementing their, their commitments under the Open Research Data Concordat, which is a concordat that's been around the sector for eight years now. It sets out particular responsibilities that universities have, that funders have, and that researchers have to make sure that research data can be shared openly where possible, but certainly in a fair way, uh, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, of course. Um, so we, we want to explore with the universities and institutions how easy that's been and how sustainable their arrangements are for supporting open research data. And I think that will be incredibly important for sharing good practice and sharing lessons, but also for informing research funders as they turn to look at the policies around research data over the next year or two. So finally, you might say, we get round to the Open Research Programme itself. Um, and the things we're going to talk about today a little bit are, are the training aspect of that, the ways in which we're aiming to reform recruitment, promotion and appraisal of staff, how we're trying to help institutions share good practice in the support of open research and how we're trying to develop some new insights and indicators for institutions to help them plan and evaluate their, the work they do and indeed the work that the UKRN does to improve, improve uh, the support for open research. So those are the things we're going to talk about. At this point I will um, ask Tim to take over and talk a little bit about training. Thank you very much. I'm going to start with the traditional sharing of the slides, uh, um, which involves the traditional question of, can you see them? Uh, yes, the, but they're not in presentation mode yet. Okay. And that's also a tradition. <laughs> Great. I forgot to put it into presentation mode. So there we are. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming along today and giving us this opportunity to update you on the obviously the most important of the four uh, elements of the open research project um, set program. And we are, we are project one, which is training. And what I want to do today is I want to talk to you um, a little bit about the most recent developments in thinking about this, which are that we've kind of been thinking about giving ourselves some very smart goals to achieve over the next years couple of years. I want to talk to you about a little bit what we've achieved in terms of uh, the first thing is the schema, which is essentially um, a syllabus for the training. The overarching plan, how we're going to deliver that, what the materials to support that delivery are, where we will get providers, how we're hoping to evaluate our element of the programme, and uh, how that might feed into reward and recognition. And finally, our newest development, I think, which is about the community of practice. Um, and there's a couple of things I should really say before I start on this endeavour, which is that um, I took over just a couple of months ago, um, building on some amazing work that had already been led by uh, Tom Stafford. Uh, and so much of this work is, is as well, I think, much. Practically all this work has been done by other people. I'm very lucky to take over from them. Uh, but the second thing is that it's really important to hear your views. Uh, so when I've finished, I hope there'll be plenty of time for questions and hopefully really good challenges uh, to help us think about whether we're doing this right and what would be best for the end users. So what do we want to do? Well, by December 2023, which is horrendously close, we're hoping to have a comprehensive training plan published, which will include plan provision, uh, the community support for delivering that, uh, work to fill in the gaps, leading to instructor training for 180 trainers 
by September 24. So what we want to do is to train 180 people in the methods of delivering training in open research. And essentially that will have two elements. So the first is some guidance on um, the sort of pedagogy of learning that we think is important um, and the guiding principles for how to, how to train, how to deliver training, how to evaluate your training. Um, for many of us, for many of you, um, I suspect you'll be more expert than us in doing that, but I think it's important to set a standard of what we think our approach is. So we'll have 180 people trained um, in various open research practices, which I'll come to when I talk about the schema. But then by one year after that date, so September 25, we would like to have had 2,700 researchers trained in those open research practices by those 180 trainers. And the astute ones amongst you will notice that's so roughly 15 people per trainer. Some will do more, some will do less. Um, and one of the things which we're really keen uh, is for institutional leads to work with their people in their institutions to identify people who would make really good trainers. Um, I have ideas about that, but I'll talk about that later. So those are our goals. And this builds upon a beautiful piece of work which says, what should we be delivering training in? And uh, this, there was um, a piece of work undertaken to identify what, as a community, uh, the UKRN would like to see tra training in. And then this was brought together in terms of the schema, which is, uh, as you can see, seven beautiful honeycombs. And we did the honeycombs because we think other areas may develop. There may be other themes. And they're put into broad groups such as planning, conducting, um, analyzing, version control. I, on a personal note, um, if I could get everyone I work with to have an accepted method of version control, I'd be so happy. Providing that the version control didn't include last last version, last version two, last version four. As long as it didn't include that, I'd be happy. Anyway, moving on. Dissemination, evaluating uh, the incentive structures, which I think will be uh, very important in terms of reward and recognition, and some other elements. Um, okay, so that's our schema, and that is available um, on, on the project website but you can see it does cover most of the things that we're interested in in terms of open research. Okay, so an overarching plan for delivery. We have two schedules. There is a public facing training schedule, which tells us, um, it says where, what research is going to, oh, sorry, research, what training is going to be available. Um, we, are, we undertook yesterday, just yesterday when we met, to add two elements to that. One is a simple mechanism for people expressing an interest in attending some training. Um, and we think that'd be useful for two reasons. One, it gives an idea of numbers who are gonna turn up, but importantly, we're looking to see where we might want to de-invest in some training if there's, not avail if there's not an appetite for it, and invest in more training where, people, where there's a, a, a big appetite. Uh, some of you may have seen the results of the open research survey that this project did. Um, and I would say across the 14 areas that we think uh, comprise open research, there was obvious interest in more in some areas over others. Um, fortunately for me, version control wasn't very popular, but data management, very popular. Uh, so public training schedule, and that is um, just for information, really, because you'll probably not see this. But as a group working on the on the training project, we have a, a working training schedule, um, which is where we receive offers of training, look to see where they would fit and and discuss the various bits of information that we need before we put it onto our public training schedule. So if you did offer the, some training, and it didn't immediately appear on the public training. That's why, because we have this two-step process. Uh, and that's about getting balance across the thing. 
Um, in terms of that delivery, we've put together a training the training wrapper um, and uh, an associated briefing. So essentially what the wrapper does is it um, does two things. One is it has a briefing element that says, this is what the open research project is. These are our values. This is our way of thinking about training. Um, and sort of gives a how to guidance on what we're trying to achieve and how uh, as a trainer, you fit into that process. Uh, and it also includes elements for um, pre and post evaluation of, uh, of the training. So there's a wrapper that does the UKR and badging bit um, and that can, that's available on the Google Drive. I'm sure someone's going to ask in the chat, can these slides be made available? And absolutely, yes, they can. So um, every training will have, have that wrap around it. Now who's, oh, oh, can I go back? Yes, who's providing our training? We have three sets of providers. Um, there are formal providers um, who are bodies outside of the UKRN who provide training such as Project Tier, uh, the carpentry courses, and a number of other formal providers. And we, are, we have relationships with them uh, that they will bring these elements to, uh, to our schedule. There are other providers who we don't have a formal relationship with, but we bring in. Again, they're external. And the third element, which we'd really like to develop, is institutional partners. So um, where institutional partners in UKRN are currently providing training, which could be of value to everyone in our wonderful organization, um, then actually that'd be really good. Um, and it'd be, I think it's particularly good because as institutional members, you're already committed to our values and our ways of working. Um, and I think it also builds that, that really strong community uh, that is, I think is one of the core elements of UKRN. It's one of the things that personally I find most rewarding about working in the UKRN is that community with a common vision, a common goal, and often common frustrations, which is useful to share. Uh, so a little bit of a plea, if you're interested in providing some training, as part of this, please do contact us and uh, we'll see what we can do. And hopefully it won't be too onerous. Uh, quite possibly rewarding. Who knows? We've produced an evaluation framework. And um, this is essentially my attempt at a graphic of doing that. Uh, we think if in terms of evaluating the impact of the training, there's three levels. Uh, there's one at the program level, which uh, what extent does the implementation of this training result in change, measurable change, um, at, in the way that institutions practice and conduct open research? Um, and some really hard, I know that uh, Neil and Marcus um, would really like to get some very hard data on that in terms of numbers of pre change in pre-registration, changes in data accessibility, changes in the adoption and use of the credit framework uh, and the reporting of the credit framework in manuscripts and fair data. Um, that's the large ambitious institution level. Second level would be looking at the trainers. Um, so as part of going through this process of becoming a trainer trainer, We'd like to understand the impact upon that in terms of their perceptions of their ability to train, to deliver training. So for the trainers, in terms of delivering training, do they feel, and forgive me if this is not familiar to everyone, there's a, the common model for behavior, health, for behavior change in psychology is the COMBI model, which is about capability, opportunity, and motivation. And we're hypothesizing that, that, excuse me, that becoming a trainer will lead to increases in perceived perceptions of capability. We 
feel it may change motivation. And that might, again, be related to reward and recognition, but the person's drive towards doing that. It's always possible that people who come for tra- to be a trainer have quite high motivation already. But what is most interesting is the opportunity. So does becoming a trainer result in increased um, opportunity, increased space, time, um, and support from your institution for delivering that training? Because it may be that those are the real barriers, that actually we can train lots of people, but if we can't get the institutions to commit to, for example, making open research training um, compulsory or highly strongly recommended, then we're not going to get that opportunity. And then the second aspect of that is it, we're going to use some measures of normalization process theory, which uh, essentially looks at whether the delivery of the training will become part of the normal conduct of work uh, within the, the for the individual and their institution. Uh, so to what extent there is there becomes a culture, if you like, to use a much ever word used word at the moment, a culture for delivering this to support the trainers. And the third element is this 2,700 people who've been trained. What we're interested with them is whether they feel they have the capability, opportunity, and motivation to do open research or to do open research practices. So for the trainers, it's about delivering training, but this is do you feel you, you have better capability, me- better motivation to do open research. Um, we'll also be looking at whether open research, they perceive open research as becoming part of the normal everyday pattern of work. And we'll also ask them um, how good the training was. Um, and that is not just about whether the trainer was, was I don't know, engaging, um, interesting, informative, but also whether the package of work that we deliver is uh, and the processes by which we deliver it are optimal, could be improved and so on. So that's how we think the training element should be evaluated. We've made us, we, we had a meeting yesterday, and I have told Neil this, but he may not have got to his email. But as a working group, we feel that we are only going to restrict ourselves to the evaluation elements for trainers and trained individuals. And that actually the program level we think is probably or should be part of um, that program level evaluation, which I think Marcus and Neil are leading as program working prog- um, program two. Good. Final thing to say here is we are, of course, committed to open research practices for this evaluation. So we will be. Um, publishing, uh, pre-publishing our our protocol. We will have our data accessible, as accessible as it can be, et cetera, et cetera. So we are hopefully going to practice what we preach. Um, I don't want to talk too much about reward and recognition, but we are producing a system of badges, which is something I never knew about, but you can get little badges that you can put on your, um, on your I think it's on your Scopus. Um, your personal Scopus page or your LinkedIn or whatever, and that will those will be available for the people who've been trained uh, as trainers and for those who've been trained. Uh, and we are going to form a community of practice. Um, one of the great things about this project, I've said this to Neil several times, is that it's not um it's completely different from any project I think I've ever done before and I've and as a result I've learned so much uh, and we've been look, digging down into how to make a good community and we found this wonderful web page called Community Canvas which talks about the functions of a community and what you can do to build a good community so we are going to as far as we can follow that guidance and as a result what we're going to start with is we're going to start with a very low level um, almost almost an email um group of the alumni and then we will bring that alumni together to say about what they would want from a community and how we can support them with the ultimate goal that the community becomes self-sustaining because it is of value to those people who are in the community 
And that's the end of my talk. I will stop sharing. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, so we do have some time now. I think we're going to pause for, for some questions and discussion, either around some of the things that I introduced, but more especially perhaps around what Tim has just talked to you about with respect to the training. So um, there's one question to kick us off uh, in the chat there, Tim, about the badges. I don't know if you want to take take that one. Uh, of course, yes. The, the, the badges will be um, specific to the elements in the schema. So, um, yes, if you so if you do well in data management, you'll get a badge for data management, um, and you can then be like the scouts. If anyone remembers the scouts, you can try to get all the badges complete. We will not be sewing them onto your shirt though, um, which as a task I spent a lot of time doing for my son. Uh, that's a great question, who are we using? Thank you, Helen. Um, can I also point out that that was a great question, is, is code for, I don't know. Um, this has been led by uh, Open badge Steve back. Bonham. Is it? There you go. Neil, you. thank you, Neil. Any other questions, comments, anything you think we should could do better? So one thing I'd, while you're thinking about um, what questions you might have for Tim, can I ask oh. everyone on the, the webinar a question? Um, maybe you could uh, use some reactions thing in Zoom. How many of you are actually thinking of taking the training and becoming trained open research trainers on, on this scheme. So if you want to raise your hands or clap or put your thumbs up or something like that, to get a sense. You've got Lydia. Yeah. Jennifer. Uh, you. Uh, may oh, I have oh, a question actually about how the trainers would be identified? Sorry, this is Lydia. Yeah, um, I can see. Um, so we are asking institutional leads uh, to identify people within their own organization. Um, yeah, so for example, in where I work in King's College London, we've, um, we've done, it's a really good question actually, I meant to say this earlier. Um, we've done two things. One is we've identified people in our libraries and collections um, who are working in the open research space um, and who we think would be really good to uh, got a lot to learn and it would also benefit the organisation when they've when they've done the training. Uh, and the second thing is I spoke to. We have vice deans of research in each faculty. So I spoke to our vice deans of research and said, what about your early career researchers who might want to do two things, learn about, get some, get some training in how to do training about open research, and then deliver one or two training courses as part of their career development. Um, because you see that as fitting in quite well. What we would detracting from other things, but as a sort of personal development thing, I think this could fit in really well. So we're sort of trying to get a balance, probably about 80% professional services or research staff who, who part of their job is delivering training, uh, and a, a smaller group of people who we think it could be a real opportunity for career development um, and I also think that's good because they'll join our community practice and they'll become advocates for open research. Before I go to Emma, um, Lydia is that a good answer or? Yeah I, I think that's a great answer but especially I think that early career researcher is a, is a great idea actually yeah thank you. 
I'm always cautious about landing more on early career researchers, but I think this is could be a really good opportunity as long as you use it correctly. Emma. Hi, thanks. Um, just one of the things you said there, I think it was just kind of a question around, and you might have said this already, around who you're targeting the training at, because obviously there, um, there are those who are earlier in their career, but actually if you're targeting at PhD students and postdocs, but not the more senior staff, we can train them as much as we want, and then they go back to their, and their PI says, no, that's not how we do it here. Like, are you doing looking at doing anything to support the kind of more senior staff in this as well? Yeah, um, and there are there, there are there are people that we will be targeting, um, not targeting, and co having conversations with, in order to target them. Um, and for us, I think I'd re really like to have some conversations with groups that aren't traditionally at the forefront of open research. Um, so we've just got a British Academy Network um, grant to sort of build up networks of researchers in arts and humans, arts and humanities, um, and social science and policy. I'm definitely going to be targeting their, their senior team because I think um, not something they traditionally think of, but it's a great opportunity for them to then learn that and reach their net and deliver that training to their network. So yeah, it's a we do have to do that. Um, the other thing, if you forgive me, outside of training is yeah, we've got to change those attitudes. Um, we've done a lot on terms in terms of thinking about policies policies for open that encourage open research, but it's those everyday practical struggles that we really need to address, making it the default action or an easier action for those people who don't currently do it. Because I think if it's difficult to do, people tend to dismiss it, particularly if they haven't done it before. So, um, is it Anka? I may have mispronounced that. In the chat is a fantastic question. Um, and it's, it's a sort of line. So the question, if, if you haven't read it, is about um, will the training be have sufficient discipline specificity? Um, and one of the things you know, for certain providers, I think we will struggle struggle with discipline specificity. But where we have greater, uh, and they will deliver the training they deliver, but where we have more control and more ability to discuss, um, what we would encourage is actually giving broad principles and then encouraging people within that group to build their discipline specific um, ideas and thoughts because some people will be further along and they'll be able to share their ideas um, uh, so that so that I think the best training teaches you the principle, those metacognitive skills, and then helps you to apply them to your specific situation. So that's what we'll be looking to do. But um, implementation is always the challenge. Easy to train people in broad principles, implementation. So, so I think we were having a discussion with Emma it's always a challenge. Um, lots of support for ECR um, opportunities. So I'm really glad I'll take that back to our group. There was a question from Marie about whether the courses will be free or need to be paid for. Oh, do you actually know the answer to that, Neil? I'd assume they were free. I do, and it gives me a chance just to mention that this this is a the Open Research Program is a membership program. I your institution joins the program, and that's what enables you to have access to, among other things. The training 
um but not all the training some of the training will be is sorry start again it's all train the trainer model as tim says and some of the sessions will be free and some of them will be uh, at a discounted rate or in other ways uh, sort of exclusive to to the program um so many but not all of the institutions that are part of the program have got some funding to pay for the training that isn't free um but i'll say uh, some of it is being paid out of central funds and will be available for free thanks neil So um, one of the reasons I could never be a spy is that I, I find um, social si social silence very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. If there's no one talking, I'll talk about anything. Uh, so yeah, that's why my application to become a member of MI6 failed. Did anybody else have any thoughts on some of the questions that have been raised or the answers that we've given? I mean, there's some really good and interesting questions and challenges there. I wonder if anyone else has got any thoughts about those. Can I ask a question again? Can we do a sort of show of hands? Um, and I can't believe that I've actually read the UK Corey annual report. And it, it, I, that those figures just didn't strike me until they put in isolation. Um, was there anyone else just really kind of taken aback by some of those questionable research practices about the level? Um, and do we think it's something we should be making more widely known to the heads of our institutions? the leaders, research leaders. It's a lot of questions. And I'm delighted to say that, uh, to now ask uh, Anna uh, from the University of Surrey to talk to us about the work that's going on in uh, the OR4 project, and I might even explain what OR4 stands for, uh, on reward and recognition for open research. Anna, over to you. Thanks, Neil. Uh, let me just share my screen uh, and uh, my slides as well. Um, hopefully everybody can see this. I don't know how to get rid of the uh, captions, so I do apologise. I'm not sure how to get rid of them. Um, anyway, let me start. <clears throat> Sorry, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Kozniewska, and I am based at the University of Surrey, like Neil just mentioned. Uh, and I am uh, one of the UKRN project officers uh, or ORCAS, as we refer to ourselves. Uh, and I also project manage the OR4 uh, project. And it is the uh, OR4 stands for Open and Responsible Research and Reward and Recognition. It is quite a mouthful. So we do refer to ourselves as OR4. Um, so um, the aim of the project, as it says on the slide, is to support the institutional implementation of responsible research assessment policies and procedures that reward and recognize open research. And I would like today to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit more about why reward and recognition for open research is important, uh, who OR4 are, uh, what we would like to achieve and what we have done so far. So firstly, let me start with a little bit of background, which will hopefully help explain why reward and recognition for open research is essential for accelerating the uptake of open research practices, which is the ultimate aim of the overall open research program. So as I'm sure you're aware, in recent years, there have been a lot of uh, conversation about open research. 
um, around applying principles of collaboration, accessibility, transparency, inclusivity, reusability, and reproducibility to the processes and outputs of research. And uh, already many public funders of research have well established policies and open access and sharing of research data. Uh, there is also a broader open research policy uh, framework which continues to develop as an example uh, the EU's most recent Horizon Europe program, which was inaugurated in 2021, has adopted a comprehensive open science policy. Uh, more locally in the UK, UKRI requires uh, that all funded research outputs include a data availability st statement and a lot of publishers are adopting the same uh, or similar policies. Now, uh, in the meantime, there is obviously this widespread discussion of concerns about the reproducibility of scientific research. Uh, Neil talked about questionable research practices this morning uh, the, uh, at the start of, of the webinar, uh, and that has mobilized a variety of stakeholder groups and led to the formation of collaborative enterprises uh, involving researchers, funders, policymakers, policy and staff at research uh, performing institutions, etc., uh, to form uh, various different groups. And the UK Reproducibility Network and its national affiliates is one example of such a group uh, who is um, dedicated to, um, to moving forward the discussion around open research. Uh, but in spite of these developments and this far-reaching discussion about all this, open research policy does remain largely aspirational. And beyond high levels of compliance of open access mandates uh, in, in some countries and in the UK, this is largely driven by the REF. Uh, there is little evidence of widespread open research practice as, as much as we would like the, uh, to see this. And there is a substantial disconnect between institutional policies and statements and the what the researchers actually do. So um, open research expectations other than open access publishing are for the most part not enforced or monitored either by, by the institutions or the funders. Uh, what is most relevant to our project is the fact that very few institutional recruitment, promotion and appraisal frameworks provide any reference to open research criteria. And uh, additionally, there is uh, very much a lack of institutional guidance or training and support related to open research for candidates and staff involving, involved in assessment. And as a consequence, uh, the use of open research practices is very rarely evidenced by candidates or considered by assessment panels, and it is not monitored by institutions. So um, in short, the open research norms are not really operationalized in the mechanisms by which researchers are incentivized and rewarded. Uh, and we believe that if open research practices are to become mainstream, it is imperative to operationalize open research expectations and requirements in institutional systems and processes, uh, and in particular, in those procedures by which researchers are assessed. And this is where OR4 hopes to make a difference. So let me start by introducing who OR4 are. Uh, so the OR4 project is made up by um, of a working group of 20 members from various UKRN institutions, both academics and professional service colleagues. Um, and the group is currently chaired by Professor Candy Rowe from Newcastle University. We also have a 14 member strong advisory group uh, who we consult regularly in order to seek their feedback on uh, the work that we are completing. And this uh, advisory group compi uh, comprises experts in the field of responsible research assessment and open research in the UK and beyond. And we are really lucky uh, to have this group because we are able to rely on their expertise when developing our resources. And finally, we are also working with a group of 14 case study and 28 community of practice institutions. And I will talk about them in a little bit more detail in a moment. Uh, these institutions will be working with the OR4 project to help us develop and refine our resources and provide case studies. And they will also have the opportunity to support and learn from each other. Um, 
so I'll talk now briefly about how the OR Thought Project is planning to help institutions reform their policies and procedures to recognize and reward open research. As you can see on the slide, the project is concerned with the implementation of responsible researcher assessment policies and procedures that recognize open research with a focus on reward and recognition. And our aim is to foster a community of staff in institutions with an interest in and responsibility for all relevant aspects of institutional practice uh, to support them in the process of improvement and to facilitate the sharing of best practice. So to achieve that goal, we are developing an implementation toolkit for institutional leaders and managers to improve local policies and practices. And this toolkit will include a maturity framework and a self-assessment tool to help the institutions assess where they are currently, where they currently find themselves when it comes to reward and recognition for open research. And also to help them uh, to progress on the maturity scale, we will provide a detailed guide, which we will develop with the help of our community of practice and case study institutions. Now, uh, these institutions, so the community practice and case study institutions, will benefit from collaborating with the project by being able to engage in conversation with other HEIs. They will uh, share practice and discuss challenges on the way to reform and reward and recognition for open research. And they will have a chance as the first group to pilot and, um, and test our resources as we develop them. Now, finally, we are keen to be part of the larger conversation on reward and recognition for open research. And to do so, we are keeping up to date with various national and international initiatives. Um, and in this area, that includes things such as DORA um, and COARA, working groups and others. Um, we are also in the process of compiling a list of initiatives and resources and tools in the area of reward and recognition for open research which we will be updating throughout the lifetime of the project. This is just so that we are aware of what is happening in this area and we are not duplicating efforts or missing things, missing uh, opportunities for collaboration. Um, so since the inception of the project, we have managed to progress work on several, several different deliverables, uh, which we have planned in our project plan. Um, if you would like to see a detailed um, account of what we've done so far, our annual review is on the OR4 project page. Um, and I would like to highlight just a few things that we have achieved so far. So as I mentioned before, we are now an established team. Uh, we have a detailed project and communication plan and the uh, project plan is available on the website as well to view. Um, we have an established advisory group uh, with representatives from uh, COARA, DORA, UNESCO, etc. Uh, and as I mentioned, that gives us an opportunity to draw on these colleagues' expertise in the area. Um, earlier this year, we have run the Institutional Policies and Practices Survey to establish a baseline of where institutions are on their way to reforming reward and recognition for open research. We also asked institutions um, where they need help and what they would like uh, from our project to help them on the journey. Um, and we were really surprised with how much response we received. Uh, we received 60 responses from various institutions, which was way more than we expected. Uh, and we think it's a great result. We are currently analysing the responses and are hoping to publish the results of the survey on our website in March 2024. So if you are from one of the institutions that uh, have completed the survey, we would just like to say uh, thank you very much. It is really, really helpful. Um, finally, as I have mentioned, we have recruited 14 case study in 28 community of practice uh, institutions. So we've divided them into those two different categories because it will depend on how much engagement they are um, happy to have with the project. So the case study institutions have agreed to work closely with us on piloting and rewarding, uh, refining our project resources. And they will also provide case studies, um, I guess it's in the name, for our guide to help us illustrate how change in various aspects of reward and recognition has been implemented across different institutions and that will hopefully help others to uh, to see how things can be done. 
in practice. Uh, and the larger community of practice uh, comprises institutions who will engage with us in a slightly more um, light touch way, but they will also benefit from being part of the discussion, sharing good practice, learning from each other, etc. cetera. Um, so we have now uh, run our kickoff meetings with the uh, case study institution, the community of practice institutions. Uh, one of them was actually today. Uh, this marks the start of our engagement with the institutions and it all sounds really positive. We've had a really, really good response from the institutions. So the last thing I wanted to mention here on this progress slide is that we have now produced a working draft of the maturity framework, uh, the self-assessment tool and the guide. And we are going to pilot these with the case study and community of practice institutions uh, starting in December 2023, which is next month. Um, so we're very excited that um, all these things are coming together and we are reaching the, the kind of next stage of the project where, where we are going to start engaging with various institutions and see how, how they engage with the resources we've produced. Um, so obviously it is important for us to know um, whether we are making a difference. Uh, and and in, in order to assess, uh, we would like to look at, at various things that where we would like to uh, to have made a difference. So uh, we hope that we are going to um, to improve to help institutions improve the level of maturity of implementation of reward and recognition for open research in policies and procedures. Uh, and particularly uh, looking at the case study and community of practice institutions that will be uh, involved closely working with us. Uh, the long term goal is for the project resources to be published and become widely used by institutions who are hoping to include open research in their research and reward and recognition policies and procedures. Obviously, the ultimate goal is for the inclusion of open research and reward and recognition of researchers to result in increased uptake of open research practices, which is the ultimate goal of the open research program. Um, so how are we going to know if we have made a difference? Well, monitoring of the far reaching goals uh, is beyond the scope of our project. And that just like Tim mentioned, it's probably going to be the, the program itself that, that is going to evaluate this. We are hoping to get an idea of whether institutions that choose to engage with us are moving in the direction of wider inclusion of reward and recognition for open research in their policies and procedures. And we're going to, we're hoping to see this from two different routes so that firstly, we are planning to rerun our institutional activity and requirements survey in March, 2026. Uh, and we will then compare the results uh, that we get in March 2026 with the baseline results uh, we are currently analysing. And we are hoping to see that uh, there has been some progress in institutional uh, reform of reward and recognition for open research. Uh, and also uh, through our engagement with the case study and community of practice institutions, particularly case study institutions, uh, we will hopefully be able to track their journey and progress, and we will update uh, information about the case study institutions on our website to reflect this. Um, so finally, I would like to touch upon really briefly uh, our engagement with other projects which operate in the area of reward and recognition for open research. Uh, we would like to maintain awareness of uh, various international networks and relevant initiatives as well as expert stakeholders to make sure that our project does add value in this area and is complementary to existing activities uh, rather than duplicating effort. Uh, you may be aware that the topic of the responsible research assessment, including reward and recognition for open research, has received a lot of attention in the UK and internationally. Uh, so we are operating in a very busy niche. Uh, so. In order to avoid reinventing the wheel and duplicating efforts, we are making sure we stay up to date uh, with the activity that is happening around the topic of reward and recognition. And that's one of the reasons why we've completed the landscape review of activities, projects and initiatives, which I have already mentioned. Um, just specifically, I would like to mention a few project initiatives and tools which we are keeping an eye of, on and which have um, informed uh, our work. So for example, the space rubric developed by Dora has shaped our thinking around the maturity framework. Although our focus is most specifically around open research, 
Um, we have engaged with the Opus project and used their resources to help us compile the landscape review. And some of the work that they are developing uh, is also relevant to some of our deliverables, uh, such as the guide, for example. We have engaged with Quara, uh, particularly in respect to the Quara working groups, and uh, we may be able to contribute to their work in the future. And finally, uh, GRASP OS or GRASP OS uh, uh, are looking at supporting emer emerging policy reform and pave the way towards an open science aware responsible research assessment uh, systems, which uh, to quote our website, they have created a community of practice, uh, which is in some ways similar to our community of practice. So we are going to keep an eye on them and, and engage with them in the future as well. This is all in an effort to uh, not just remain um, aware of what's going on, but also uh, to be able to disseminate what we are doing and make sure that we are complementing the work that is happening already. So uh, just to wrap up, um, if you would like to stay up to date um, as to what is happening with OR4 and, and the work that we're doing. Uh, we do have a web page which is part of the overall UKRN uh, website and the link is on the slide and I believe we're sharing these slides so you'll be able to access this. Uh, at the moment we just have uh, our annual progress review on there and the project plan but we will be publishing tools, resources and case studies on there as they develop and emerge. Um, you are very welcome to join our GIST mailing list uh, where we will also be including some uh, updates on what is happening within the project. Um, there will be an online information event in mid-2024 and communications will uh, be circulated closer to the date. Um, and finally, feel free to contact myself or Robert Darby with any comments or questions. Uh, these are our email addresses. Um, and again, they will be on the slides. Uh, so whenever you have any comments uh, or any feedback, you think we could be doing something better, please feel free to, to get in touch. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. And I will stop sharing. Amazing, thank you ever so much, Anna. Uh, there's so much there. And it's so important. So uh, thank you for uh, so clearly taking us through the, the work that the uh, OR4 team is doing. I feel there must be uh, questions and comments and feedback. Uh, so let's give people a minute or two to think about that. I mean, it does strike me that, um, you know, I haven't done the maths, but with those uh, 40 or so institutions that you're talking about working with there, Anna, that must be you know, more than half of the researchers in the UK must be part of um, part of the project now, or the institutions that are part of the project. That's yes. A massive, massive initiative across the United Kingdom. Yes, quite a big chunk of, of the HEIs are actually part of it. Um, and I have to say they, the vibe during the kickoff meetings was really, really good. And, and we've had so many um, great discussions already, even though we've only met with, with the institutions once. So uh, we're very, uh, very happy with how these meetings went and, and everybody was really enthusiastic about working with us. That's great. But it must make it one of the, if not the biggest, then one of the biggest initiatives of its kind in the world. So that's extraordinarily significant. Um, well, people are thinking, so here's a, here's a challenging question that I think we, we're going to grapple with and continue to grapple with as we as we proceed in the project. And it, it, it's a similar question to the one that, that came to Tim in the training around disciplinary differences. And clearly, you know, open research looks and feels very different in theatre studies than it does in high energy physics. And so how are we going to be confident that institutions are recognising the sort of the appropriate practices for all of their academics, uh, especially, you know, if they're a, a comprehensive university that has has research across the, a wide range of fields? Yes. 
Yeah, I mean, it's it was something that uh, we asked um, representatives for our from our case study and community of practice institutions to to think of some challenges uh, to do with uh, reward and recognition, and that was one of the challenges that that came up quite a lot. How do we roll this out um, in a way that doesn't disadvantage uh, certain disciplines where open research might look very different? Uh, from other disciplines where maybe it is more ingrained or there is a you know a longer tradition of open research so you know there are no ready answers at the moment and that's why we're so excited to work with those institutions to come up with sort of collective solutions um because obviously it's, it is easier to have so many brains working together on something like that than than us kind of offering an arbitrary solution that might work for, for some and not work for for some other institutions yeah, absolutely. And having that, that diversity of institutions should enable us to get lots of different kinds of case studies, different sorts of vignettes and, and examples and materials that would be relevant in different kinds of research settings and fields and so on. So it's a real strength of having got such a wide variety and big, big range of institutions involved. Yes, yeah, completely agree. So I'm looking in the chat and I'm looking for hands. I can't see anybody. I must have been really clear, I guess. I think you were, <laughs> absolutely. Um, everyone's convinced. All right, uh, we can come back uh, at the end. If, if something occurs to you that you'd like to talk uh, to Anna about or to each other about with respect to reward and recognition for open research, then please uh, do, do sort of post something in the chat and we can come back to it uh, after that. But yeah, thank you very much, Anna. That's brilliant. Uh, and yeah, we please share the slides with Kate and she'll circulate them with the recording of the, the meeting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, in which case, uh, it's down to me for the sort of the last little section today. Let's see if I can actually share the slides. So um, just as a reminder, uh, these are the sort of four elements of the open research program that we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to move on next to talk a little bit about sharing institutional practice. I won't say too much about that today because I think we'll come back to that uh, for a longer session at a future one of these. And then I'll spend a bit more time perhaps talking about, about indicators, frankly. Uh, and both Anna and Tim have, have referenced the programme uh, level evaluation, so this is a part of that work. So... Um, the work to start with the work around um so zoom has put things all over my slide so i can't actually see what i'm talking to um talking about institutional sharing so the point of this strand of the work of the open research program is really to to make it easier for universities uh, and other institutions to share good practice and share lessons uh, uh, among each other it's to build as, as Tim said to build that community to enable that community that UKRN is to work better um, and so what tools can we use to enable ourselves as a community of institutions in this case to to share things with each other perhaps draft policies perhaps guidance perhaps training um, perhaps other things uh, so at the moment, the work that's gone on so far is that all of the, the partner institutions, the 22 partners in the programme, have put up a sort of a static web page. So if you look on the, the UKRM website and you look at the programme, sort of part of, of the UKRM website, you'll find pages for each of the, the 20 or 22 universities that are partners in the, in the programme. And, and each, of those, uh, um, each of those pages um, I seem to have picked King's College here as, a, as the example on the slide, uh, but um, as you can see, outlines who, who is the UKRN institutional lead, who's the local network lead at that institution, who's the, the open research coordinator, and then it goes on beyond the, what you can see there to talk about the kinds of statements that the institution has signed up to kinds of guidance and support and infrastructure the institution offers its researchers to support open research, the kind of training it delivers, uh, and so on. So it's an opportunity there really for institutions to share what's publicly available uh, that they do to support open research. And I know that these pages have already been really useful, for example, for institutions uh, even outside of the programme to, to see what kinds of things their peers are doing 
uh, and the kinds of things that they might want to consider doing. And you know, the points, uh, an easy one-stop place to, to find all of those policies and statements and so on that you might want to, to learn from so you don't have to start from scratch. But we're not content with that. We want to build this out into what we've called, perhaps naively in the bid, a living website. Um, and so this is a place which is much more dynamic than simply a set of static public web pages and a, a real sort of an expression of the community that this uh, group of institutions is becoming and a way for us to share perhaps things that we're not ready to share openly publicly yet um, and say draft documents and, and so on um, that's going to take a little bit of thought as to how we do that um, it needs to be a tool that serves the community uh, it's not a tool for its own sake we need to identify who the community is and what they want to do uh, and that's the work that we're going to be doing over the next few months, led by Stephen Vidovich at Southampton University, uh, but with a small group around him uh, to run some, some interviews, some focus groups, and really develop a specification for what we think this thing needs to be in order to serve the purpose that we want it to serve. So I've not got too much more to say about that, but that's, that's a general idea of what this is going to be. As I say, we'll come back and, and give you a much more detailed update on this in possibly the next one of these uh, webinars. So I'll pause there in case anybody wants to, to ask me a difficult question about that. Um, it, would appear, it would appear nobody does. Everyone's keen to get on to the indicators. So I'll move on to that. Um, so this is uh, now the, the project in the programme led by Marcus Manafa, who's the chair of the UK Around Steering Group. Um, on evaluation design. So in a sense, this is the program evaluation level that Anna and Tim have both mentioned so far. And at the moment, this is sort of comprising of three, three strands of work for the program. One has been, been developing some theories of change um, for each of the projects, including you know, the one that Anna described and the one that Tim described. Drawing from the, the UK Treasury uh, Magenta book on program evaluation to really set out what you know, what are the inputs here, what are the outputs, what are the outcomes, and what are the impacts that we're intending to have, and what are the interventions that we're intending to, to put in place in order to, to achieve those things. Um, so if you like a sort of logic model kind of approach. So we've got those set out and you can see uh, those all documented in the, the annual report that that strand of the work put out, and that's on the, the UKRM web, website. Um, we also, as many of you know, ran a survey uh, at the beginning of this year, end of, end of last year perhaps, and we've been analysing that and there's more analysis to be done on that, especially looking at the qualitative responses to that. But that survey looked at sort of the prevalence of open research practices, their importance, uh, and the extent to which institutional support such as training or reward and recognition uh, was, was adequate or the approaches that institutions were taking to those things. And that survey, certainly the quantitative findings from that has been really influential in, in support um, sort of informing both the reward and recognition work that Anna's talking about but also the training priorities that Tim talks about and each of the participating institutions has now had their data set back so that they, they're able to use that. Now with our next steps here are to think about you know we ran this survey there are other open research surveys out there and there's the brief open research survey that was led by Emma Norris and Charlotte Pennington and Kate uh, to UE and, and, and others, which is now being run uh, at an international level through the, the reproducibility networks. Um, there's the Centre for Open Science Open Scholarship Survey. And we know that there are other sort of open research, open scholarship surveys that particular institutions have developed, such as Oxford. And that seems to us too many surveys. So at the very least, what we need to do, I think, is to develop some coordination between them, see whether we can develop some consistency, perhaps in terminology and vocabulary, perhaps in sort of a, taking a question bank type approach to sort of taking some, uh, some common guidance on so sampling strategies to get to better samples, to, to reduce the burden on the respondents that we keep asking for, for responses to these surveys. There's, there's a massive problem with this sector being over surveyed. So we need to do some work together on that and we started the conversation with the, the BORS team, the Brief Open Research Survey team and we've reached out uh, to the Centre for Open Science to see whether they want to have part of this conversation and I think they do. So that's that's quite exciting. Uh, we're not going to think about in the programme running another survey for another two or three years so we've got some time to do this work um, 
And so we will crack on with that. But the thing uh, I perhaps want to focus and perhaps spend a little bit more time on today is the, the open research indicators work, which is, I guess, the third strand of, of this project on evaluation. Clearly, all three of these strands need to come together, and that's part of the work we need to do over the next year to integrate them. But for the moment, what we're doing around open research indicators is to to uh, develop some pilot projects uh, at institutions. Um, and these pilots are intended very much to be an exploratory and learning exercise. We know that there's been some work, some really good work in some cases done to develop indicators of particular aspects of open research. Um, uh, but it's been done in different places and that's, that's fine. That sort of innovation is, is absolutely key and vital that, that it is done. But what we want to do now is to offer a chance for uh, a group of institutions, about 15 institutions actually, not all of which by any means are part of the programme. So this is in a sense a little bit like the, the reward and recognition project. Starts in the programme, starts with the 22 institutions that are partners in the programme, but has, has gone very much beyond that to, to institutions that are interested but are not part of the programme. Uh, so we have a group of about 15 institutions who will work with what we call solutions providers uh, to to see whether or not we can work out good practice in monitoring aspects of open research. Uh, we asked institutions uh, earlier this year what their priorities would be because we want this to be very much led by the institutions uh, and their needs because the, the indicators, just to be clear, that we're talking about here are the sorts of indicators that institutions will use to plan interventions and to evaluate whether or not those interventions have been successful. So exactly the sorts of interventions that Tim has talked about with respect to training and that Anna has talked about with respect to reward and recognition. So these are not indicators to inform researcher assessment. I want to make that you know, fairly clear distinction between those two kinds of indicators. The ones we're talking about here are aggregate, anonymous, and about um, sort of institutional change and support. They're not about research assessment. So um, the idea is for us over the course of the next month or two to design some of these pilot projects and then during the course of the calendar year 2024 to, to run those in these institutions. Um, and it may be that some of these institutions join together to, to run them together, or it may not be. And we've got some workshops in a couple of weeks to start really exploring what that might look like. Um, now, this is, I haven't shown this slide before to anyone, and it, it may not work, but here's a Rubik's Cube, because there are sort of several, there are three dimensions to these pilots. So, of course, there are, there's a set of institutions, as I say, there's about 15, but here's some, here's some names um, of some that are interested. So this is one dimension. Um, we've got a group of institutions who are interested in running pilots. We've also got a set of solutions providers who have expressed interest. Um, you know, we still need to work with them to uh, work out what these pilots are and, and uh, get agreements. But among those who have expressed interest, uh, solutions providers such as such as these uh, and institutions have expressed interest in in working with these. Um, and the, the four topics, the four priorities that institutions have expressed it, um, that they want to, to focus on in terms of monitoring open research are open and fair data, data availability statements, pre-registration, and the use of the credit taxonomy. And of course, you know, there's various aspects of, of each of those that we might want to monitor and there are various reasons that we might want to be monitoring those sorts of things, uh, benchmarking, baselining, evaluating particular event interventions and so on. So there's quite a lot of work now needed to clarify that. Now, of course, if you take all of those three sort of all of those dimensions together, it's possible we could have many, many, many pilots and the, uh, we're not going to run 27 or, or however many pilots that's going to be. That would be far too many. So we're hoping that uh, some of the solutions providers will work together with groups of the institutions to work on one or more of those topics or priorities uh, and that clustering will help us make this a bit of a manageable process. But all of that is uh, still to be negotiated, still to be developed over the course of the next month or two. Um, the idea of course is for us to learn some lessons. How do we best measure these sorts of things? Um, 
share those lessons as widely as we possibly can. And those lessons may take, may take the form, for example, of data definitions or good practice in, in sort of uh, in the use of indicators for particular things. And we might want to sort of work with ex centers of expertise to help us understand how to do that. And, and one might be, uh, I don't know, we, we could we could negotiate with CWTS at Leiden, for example, for, on those sorts of and getting that sort of expertise into this program. Um, but once we've learned the lessons, once we've got the data definitions, once we've uh, reasonably confident that that this is a good way of, of measuring these sorts of things and perhaps other things as well, then we want to roll out these indicators across the program uh, and have them as a way of, of monitoring progress across the program. So that's my last slide. Uh, I hope that was a useful and interesting run through um, the last couple of projects that are part of the program. Uh, very happy to take questions and I can already see them coming in. David. Hi there now. Um, um, I'm just wondering um, how much uh, development of indicators that might already be going on um, at individual institutions, um, or at least, you know, thinking about that sort of set of issues. And it, it would be quite useful, wouldn't it, for UKRN to make sure that, you know, plans dovetail with, with projects that are perhaps already happening in some universities. And I'm not just sort of imagining that because I happen to know in my own institution at UCL, we are already quite a long way down the development of uh, our own sort of ind indicators process in a bit of a bottom up way. Um, maybe, you know, and it may be that some of these things can be achieved without actually needing to um, uh, hire a, a you know, commercial company to do data crunching for us. Yeah, no, thanks, David. Um, so I, I, absolutely, there is there's all sorts of good work going on in a number of institutions. I was at a, um, a RLUK webinar um, that the University of Manchester was explaining some of the work they've been doing uh, also, which is, which is terrific work, and, and they're part of this, this group of institutions here. So yeah, I mean, I should have highlighted that one of the purposes here is exactly for institutions to share what they're doing, uh, share good practice here. I think there are potential opportunities here for us to work with, let's call them third parties. Um, they're not all commercial by any means um, because uh, they will have data that has different qualities, either in extent or, or, or in nature than we might have. Um, and I think that will, you know, has real possibilities of enhancing the sorts of indicators that we as institutions are able to use. I, c I can imagine you know, institutions being able to do something that is informative locally, but that wouldn't scale up to cover, you know, 150 institutions and produce all sorts of comparative metrics, et cetera, et cetera. No, and we need to be, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? You mentioned comparative there. We need to be quite careful, of course, about making making rankings of institutions, if I can paraphrase where that might end up. Um, so one of the one of the things that I'm quite keen on doing with the UKRN work is to have institutions bringing together their own data and their own work with the data and work of the third party providers in ways that, in a sense, quite make it quite difficult to compare institutions because that that might be a feature rather than a bug um, because we're quite keen on helping institutions move in their according to their own missions rather than you know all moving in the same direction because that's what we think everyone should be doing we'll, we'll see how that works out though but you raise a really interesting point thanks any other questions about the indicator work okay i've noticed a question from carol in the chat um which i think think is probably going to be for you, Anna. I don't know if you can see that.
yes, I think it's a, uh, it's for me. Thanks, Carol. Um, Yes, I mean, it's uh, in the resources that we provide to the institutions, we sort of suggest a certain certain route, starting with, say, establishing leadership, looking at, um, at getting this sort of senior buy-in and then moving on down the process. But obviously, uh, like you say, different institutions might have started the process already. And we're quite lucky to have a, a quite a interesting mix of institutions who are working with us some of them are, qu are quite advanced along the journey and some of them have only started some of them don't even have any anything apart from really being willing to start um uh, so we'll just have to wait and see i guess um and you know the the reason why we want to um publish the case studies is exactly so that we can illustrate how different institutions go about uh about starting and progressing on the journey and my feeling is that that there might not be one way of doing this because obviously if each institution is different there will be some that are more uh, research intensive there will be some that are more teaching intensive we've got some institutions who uh, are not really uh are research institutes as such not universities so they they are again slightly different uh, so there will be quite a lot of different variables that will dictate where people start uh, on their journey. So obviously, if, hopefully our case studies that we will publish on the website will be able to illustrate that. Um, and as we populate our guides, this will also provide uh, other institutions that want to do the same thing uh, to be able to see you know, who they are similar to and which solution is going to most likely work in their case. I hope that answers the question. Great, Thank, thanks, Anna. Um, and it, and it's great that the approach that we're taking here is is to be as flexible. You know, the, the framework we're putting in place is going to be as flexible as as it is. Um, some of you may may be aware that in the United States, there's an initiative called Helios, which is a, a sort of alliance of about a hundred U.S. institutions. Um, quite top down, but it's to promote open science and they're developing work to to promote reform of reward and recognition for open science there. And they're they're still at the stage of, of advocating for it at the senior level of institutions. So in a, in a sense, we are potentially a little bit ahead. But they were when I explained what we were doing here, they said, well, how can you do how can you have one framework that's going to work for all the diversity of institutions? But I think the approach that you've been taking, Anna, and your team is is you know, absolutely going to enable that to happen. Um, any other questions or comments or challenges? Things that we've forgotten? People that we should be talking to that aren't here? No. OK, well, in which case uh, we can close a little bit early. I hope that's been useful for you. Uh, as Kate said, the recording and some slides will come around to you in the next week or two. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you ever so much for joining. It's been uh, great to have this conversation with you and I look forward to doing it again in six months time or so.